Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Federal Society event. This is Constitution Day. Um, Sunday was Constitution Day all over the country, so this is sort of Constitution Week. Um, Every week is Constitution Week. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've got Professor Black Knight over here in the Federal Society. We're Professor Black. Um, I just want to remind everyone to sign in on the sign-in sheets that are floating around and up here by the food. Um, that is actually how we justify getting food and paying for it. So, well, more so, let's just do sign in. Um, also, a reminder to sign up with the National Office for $5. If you haven't done that yet, that also helps us justify our events and have food. <laughs> so, um, also, if you sign up with the National, you get one of these t shirts, which is super cool. Whoa, what's that say? It says at FedSoc is TCL, our Twitter handle. Mm -hmm. They're really soft. I don't really like t shirts, but I like this one. So you get that for free if you sign up for the National and you can uh, demonstrate it to us. So I think we'll get started. Um, these two look like they're ready. <laughs> so the Federal Society um, is a society for law and public policy studies. Public policy studies, as says everywhere. Um, usually we host debates to encourage discussion about those policies through lots of private donations from a network of over 60,000 lawyers, judges, and legal scholars, and just like private citizen individuals, civilians. Um, they give money so that we can have these conversations, these discussions. Um, the Federalist Society chapters are able to provide this free lunch for students to encourage these kinds of discussions. Um, I really like that you come and listen. Listen to these ideas. Um, please sign it. So I really like policy studies, obviously. That's why that's a big part of why I decided to join FedSOG. But I really don't like politics. Um, it seems like politics are the way that we implement policy, but it gets all like lost in translation somehow. It seems like policy, politics just distracts from basic important principles, principles that I think we all kind of agree, maybe. I guess we'll find out today. Um, the principles I'm thinking of are the three that uh, the Federal Society is founded on, and those are that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. And I saw a few of you guys this time and last time like mouthing those, like lyrics for songs, and that's really cool that you guys are like, have it in your heart. <laughs> well, these principles are intended to inform the policy decisions that we all make as lawyers and members of our legal community. So I personally think of these principles as foundational to the drafting of our Constitution. Um, the reason I chose to become involved with the Federal Society is because these principles, like beyond and outside of politics, make sense to me. They seem to be valid in and of themselves, um, outside of political discussion and maybe this cultural war thing that's happening. Um, but I have to admit that I'm kind of tormented with the idea or with the tension between the difference the difference between my understanding of what happened and what the primer is actually intended, um, and then how we should implement that now. And because this understanding informs my and our actions as future lawyers, I'm really trying to get it right. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to do here with Constitution Day. Um, I'm not a constitutional law professor, and I probably will never be, um, but we have two right here. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't already know about our resident con law experts, Allow me to introduce to you Professor Randall Kelso and Professor Josh Blackman. I think that they. Um, we need no introduction. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Thank you so much, Ashley. <clears throat> I'm grateful to the Federal Society for hosting this by my good friend Randy Kelso. Uh, we don't agree on much, but we get along pretty well, which I think is a good testament to that we can have a civil debate on the Constitution. And I don't think there's much debate today. Uh, one frame that I always like to discuss with my students. Um, is both the permanence and the non-permanence of the Constitution. Um, on the one hand, our Constitution, which has seven articles and 27 amendments, has been changed very few times in the last 200 years. Uh, we have the oldest continuous serving Constitution in the world. Uh, the British Constitution is not written, so they don't count. But our Constitution has more or less stayed in the same shape for some time. But if you look at the Constitution today, and you look at constitutional law today, um, they're not always the same thing. Our Constitution, which has been amended again only 27 times, has 
uh, been interpreted by the judiciary and by other branches of government in ways uh, that are probably not consistent with how the documents were originally understood. So on the one hand, I can sit here and say we have the oldest constitution in the world, USA, USA. But on the other hand, I can also say that the document has not been followed as originally designed. Right? So where does that leave us? Right? How do we understand the relationship between the Constitution and constitutional law? Right? How do we understand the two? So I think the starting point right, is to get some easy things out of the way. Uh, there are some who argue that the notion of judicial review is illegitimate and we should have courts. I think that uh, it's not the case that Judges certainly have the power to set aside laws that they find in the Constitution. Um, but that's not the end of the story, right? Uh, the end of the story, and I think the story that I want to talk about today, um, uh, concerns the notion of the courts as a supreme institution. So it, it's indeed true the court is supreme, uh, but supreme in its own jurisdiction. Uh, you can read the supremacy clause which says that the Constitution and the laws of the United States are the supreme law of the land. Uh, it says nowhere that the Supreme Court's interpretation of the is supreme. So where does this notion come from that has a monopoly on interpreting the Constitution? Where does this notion come from? Um, it's, it's not in the Constitution, it doesn't say that. Uh, in fact, all officials Constitution. And much of is the courts. Easy example. Every time a police officer decides, do I frisk this guy or not, he's making a decision on constitutional law. Every time a prosecutor decides, do I bring in this or not, he's making a decision. Right? Every time a local Municipality decides to condemn a piece of property for them to name. He's made this decision on constitutional law. Um, every time the military decides to launch a bomb somewhere, right? The decision about the scope of the president's war making powers. I give you examples on and on. But much of constitutional law is decided on Small percentage of those ever actually make it to the judiciary. But generally, the judiciary gets it. Most people simply assume that that's the end of the story and that the party ends there. Um, and that's certainly, but that isn't necessarily the only way of looking at it. I'll give you a couple um, easy examples, maybe to sell some in this case later today. So. Any of my colleagues will get a preview. It's a very famous case called Ex parte Marion. Um, and the facts of the case were like this. Uh, shortly after the Civil War commenced, um, President Lincoln uh, was in office and he decided to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Um, if you read the Constitution, it agree that the branch of government that we Powers. But he did it himself, and ultimately Congress ratified it and said we agree. Different story. So under the suspension of habeas corpus, that any charges lock him up, no lawyer, and hold him indefinitely. Whoa, right? Big, big deal. Um, this happened. The U.S. military, the Union Army, arrested a guy named Merriman in Maryland. Maryland was a border state that had a lot of Southern sympathizers. And he was held at Fort, Mc Fort McHenry, which is in Baltimore. Um, uh, Merriman's lawyers managed to swear out a writ of habeas corpus to Roger Tawney. Yes, the same Roger Tawney from Dred Scott. Um, 
Unclear exactly why he was even presiding. He was a circuit justice from Maryland. This was not a case brought in the jurisdiction of the circuit court. And uh, Taney issued an order telling the courts, I'm sorry, telling the general, bring Merriman here, deliver his body, habeas corpus, right? produce the body, bring him here. Um, the general didn't show up himself. He didn't send Merriman. He said he sent one of his assistants to bring a letter saying, uh, Your Honor, uh, no. <laughs> We're in the middle of a war, and this guy is a suspect, suspected of committing war crimes or whatever else. We're going to hold him. At that point, Chief Justice Taney uh, uh, issued an order. He said to the marshal of the court, I want you to go to Fort McHenry and get the general, bring him here. Can you imagine, right? You're some poor marshal, you know, probably paid not much, and you want to go up to a Union army, knock on the door of this humongous fort, and say, hey, general, I'm arresting you, right? I'm placing you under arrest on the authority of the Chief Justice of the United States, actually Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, to be precise, and I'm going to bring you down here. <laughs> As you can imagine, he came up and knocked on the door, they said, screw off, go away. Okay. So then Taney issued this opinion, which is often misunderstood, but what the opinion basically says is, uh, the president can't suspend habeas corpus. This must be a decision of Congress. Uh, but, Taney said, I recognize I can't make anyone do something, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to order my opinion to be sent to Washington, to President Lincoln. Now, it's often said that um, uh, President Lincoln ignored Taney, which is simply false. Uh, Taney, uh, is, there's no evidence Lincoln was even aware of this order. But the fact is, when it comes down to brass tacks, the courts have, as Hamilton said, they're the least dangerous branch. They have not the power of the sword or the power of the purse. They only have the power of their judgments. And the courts were not able to do anything, right? They, they said, release the guy, and the general said no, and that was it. So I'll give you another example. This is a situation in the aftermath of Brown. So we all know the case Brown, the Board of Education. You may think it overturned Plessy versus Ferguson. It did not. It did no such thing. You may think that it immediately desegregated schools nationwide. Not even close. What Brown said was that for four states, so it was Kansas, Delaware, South Carolina, and Virginia, that the schools had to take action to desegregate with all deliberate speed. That was the word used in the opinion, all deliberate speed. What about Arkansas? Arkansas was not a party to Brown. Not a party to the case. Then you had Central High School in downtown Little Rock. And if you ever go there, it's, it's a national park. It's actually still high school. I visited it. Kind of like a creep walking around the high school, but you know, it's, it's history. Um, uh, Central High School in Little Rock is the site of a major confrontation between the branches of our government. Here's what happened. A state judge in Arkansas said, under state law, schools must remain segregated. A federal judge in Little Rock said the opposite, said, no, 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 under Brown v. Board, I am ordering the school to be segregated. What do you do? You have a state judge saying, segregate, and you have a federal judge saying, integrate. Neither a federal state judge or a district court judge are superior. They're not. They both have an equal claim to the Constitution. They both take a vote to the Constitution. The case was appealed up. The Court of Appeals said, integrate. And Arkansas said, wait a minute, Eighth Circuit, you're not superior to our state courts. You're not. Okay. Um, it goes to the Supreme Court, right? <coughs> Supreme Court says, hey, Arkansas, you know, you're, you're bound by Brown. Right? You're bound by Brown. You have to integrate it. Now, if the Supreme Court had just done that and nothing else, is there anything that would require the governor of Arkansas or of to integrate the schools? To ignore them. But something funny happened before the Supreme Court's decision. President Eisenhower, the former general, ordered the 101st Airborne to escort African-American students into the building. It was called the Little Rock Nine, basically these nine students, 
who were denied entry to the building. And they were let in. It's actually quite scary if you look at these pictures. I mean, they were more or less lynch mobs standing next to these federal troops who were supervising these kids. And uh, I've read that the first day of class, these kids sat in the principal's office. They wouldn't get killed, right? They, they didn't go to class. They, they were sitting in the principal's office all day. Um, after time, it somewhat faded, and, and you know, things went, perhaps went to normalcy. But I often ask my students, what would have happened if President Eisenhower hadn't sent the federal troops? Right? Um, so the point I'm conveying to you is that the judiciary only has power to the extent that people listen to it, right? If the other branches of government aren't going to give the judiciary its due weight, there's not much that the courts can do. They have either, as Hamilton said in Federal 78, the power of the sword or the power of the purse. They have only the power of will and their judgment. That's all they have. So to return back to my opening remarks, we have this constitution which has remained largely unchanged in the text at least for 200 some odd years. Many amendments, but the, you know, the, the core of it's still there. But the courts have updated it in ways that are unthinkable to the framers. Um, they've only been able to do that though, because as a society, as a polity, there hasn't been a coup, right? There hasn't been a revolution. Right? When the 2000 election happened and the Supreme Court issued the decision of Bush v. Gore, uh, Al Gore, I'm sure, was not happy with that decision. He came out and said, the Supreme Court spoke, that's final, right? Let's move on. And that was an amazing act of fortitude, right? Because he could have kept arguing that, no, this is legitimate, count the ballots, count the chads, you know. But he said, let's move on. Eisenhower was no fan of Brown v. Board. In fact, his, his views on integration are, are, are subject to a lot of debate. But he said, you know what? The courts have spoken here. I'm going to send in federal troops to escort these children to school. Right? And then we go to Lincoln. Right? Now, Lincoln did not ignore Tawney, but the general sure as hell did. And the general said, yeah, we're prosecuting a war here. We're not letting this guy out. So, Mr. Justice, you can keep writing your orders, and we'll keep doing our business. Go back even further with Marbury versus Madison. Right? Had Jefferson ordered, I'm sorry, had, had, had Chief Justice Marshall ordered Jefferson to give the commission, the judgeship, to uh, William Marbury, Jefferson would have said, screw off, right? So when you study the Constitution <clears throat> and when you study the courts, always pay very close, special attention to the relationship of the Constitution to the other branches. The courts do not operate in a vacuum. Courts can't say whatever the hell they want and hope the other branches just take it lying down. For the most part, when the courts act, the other branches say, all right, we'll do a follow. But that's not a guarantee. And there may come a point in your lives or ours where a judge says something and the people say, no. And then once it happens, we're not, in the United States, we're like in Venezuela, right? Where you know, the rule of law has collapsed. It's a fragile thing, and the courts have, I think, done their best to manage that rule of law, uh, but often in a way that's in no way consistent with the original text and history of the Constitution, which is what we're here to celebrate. I'll, I'll pause on a note that was mentioned to my students. Congress passed a law that requires any uh, institution that accepts federal money to have a program on Constitution Day, which is September 17th. I don't think that statute is constitutional. I think it's more of a compelled speech. So I'm actually glad we are celebrating this not on Constitution Day, but as an act of our own volition and not as a federal mandate. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's one of those issues that will never come to court. So we'll never I'll say this. I got two basic points on the themes that Josh just uh, uh, talked about. Um, one is, he's of course exactly right, that when the Supreme Court says something, when a court says something, that's not the end of the story. The question is, how is it implemented, and who implements it, and how faithfully do people either listen to it or, or not. Um, and the one thing he sort of indicates that in general, most of the time in our nation's history, uh, responsible official government actors have paid attention 
that to what the Supreme Court has said, and even when they don't necessarily personally agree, like President Eisenhower and, and Brown v. Board, Eisenhower understood the Supreme Court said, hey, Brown, you're supposed to integrate. The Supreme Court's going to say it applies to Arkansas. So Eisenhower sent the troops in. Uh, that wouldn't have been, I don't think, his policy preference, but he said, I'm going to enforce because I'm going to pay deference to the Supreme Court's interpretation. Um, uh, so when individuals do that, it, it does, in fact, give the Supreme Court's decisions a, a lot more weight than they might have otherwise uh, had. And even in Ex parte Maryland, as indicated, maybe the, the, the general the isolated case of that one individual didn't listen much. Uh, but Lincoln didn't take that as a sign that he was going to ignore the Supreme Court broadly uh, during the Civil War. He, uh, he, again, paid attention to, to trying to stay, broadly speaking, within uh, the boundaries of his understanding of the law. Uh, and so that, that's a real critical point. It's a real critical point in our nation's history that uh, actors have done that because it's true. There's nothing the court themselves, they don't have troops. They don't have enforcement power directly on their own uh, very much. Now, of course, what they can do if someone doesn't follow their orders, they can hold someone in contempt. Uh, you can hold someone in contempt of court, uh, and that's, to, to some extent, a power. Um, on this issue, though, you know, one of the things, I think it's the most troubling thing, that with all the other things going on in, 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 in the world the last month or so, hadn't got as much pressure as it should have, uh, was President Trump pardoned of, of Joe Arpaio out in Arizona. Uh, he didn't follow a, a court order there regarding uh, treatment of uh, uh, Hispanics and uh, the stop and frisk and things of that kind and questioning. Uh, he was found in contempt of court. Uh, the, the judiciary said, you're violating our orders. We're finding you in criminal contempt of court. Um, but instead of standing behind that, President Trump just pardoned him and said, I don't care that you're in criminal contempt of court. I'm going to give you a, your free card. Um, that really undermines the rule of law. No, the presidents generally don't do that. Presidents generally stand behind the courts when they ask for enforcement power. Uh, President Trump didn't in, in that case. He just pardoned Mateo, even though he was found in contempt of court. And in terms of sort of adherence to the rule of law, that to me is sort of very, uh, very kind of disturbing if it becomes more of a trend. Uh, and particularly as the Russia investigation goes forward, uh, the issue arises, well, how many other people will Trump end up pardoning uh, to try to avoid court scrutiny of actions? Uh, you know, Nixon didn't pardon anybody during Watergate. And, and Nixon didn't destroy the tapes when they were he was told by the court to produce them. He produced the tapes. He didn't pardon any of his associates uh, who were up for obstruction of justice. Uh, it is true that after he resigned, President Ford pardoned him, sort of let the nation move on. Uh, but all the rest of the actors, uh, Nixon didn't even consider pardoning them. Um, I'm not as confident Trump is going to take that, that, that perspective. Um, but absent in the usual case like that, it is... It is comforting that, in general, throughout our nation's history, uh, the official actors have to sort of tried to uh, stand behind what the courts say the law is. Okay, now the other point about, you know, is the court today interpreting the Constitution in ways different than the framers would have imagined? You know, that's the big debate, really, in constitutional interpretation theory, is between do you interpret the Constitution as a living Constitution, where some of the broad terms in freedom of speech, uh, free exercise of religion, equal protection, due process, uh, do they have a meaning that evolves over time in light of our better understandings of what equality or liberty under the due process clause means? Uh, or do we give them a more static interpretation and ask, well, what did the framers and ratifiers at the time the provision was ratified, what did they think equal protection meant or due process meant or freedom of speech meant? Um, that is sort of so I think the foundational sort of issue that divides uh, the justices in thinking about how to interpret the, the Constitution. Um, it's often said in the Federal Society's sort of official position uh, really is uh, that the framers expected the Constitution to be more a static Constitution, to be fixed at the time of ratification, and that we ought to interpret it in light of what's called the original intent uh, at the time of ratification. Uh, and therefore, when the majority of the court today, because typically the liberals from the Warren Court on, and on the Supreme Court today, the four democratically appointed justices, and then Justice Kennedy, uh, the five of them, will give the Constitution often a living Constitution, evolving meaning in terms of what equality or liberty under due process or freedom of speech means. 
And the federal side, of course, criticizes that heavily. It says, no, they're, they're interpreting the Constitution in the way the framers would never have imagined. The framers would have expected a static interpretation in light of sort of their views at the time of ratification. Um, I think there is almost no historical evidence that that's what the framers believed. But the framers were living in an 18th century belief in natural law, particularly enlightenment natural law, where there was a belief that broad moral concepts, our understanding of them, would evolve over time. Uh, and that uh, people would come better to understand the meaning of things, uh, uh, and they wouldn't be fixed at the time of ratification. The theory of sort of static interpretation is more, in the jurisprudential sense, a positivist theory, that there are positive rights you have in a document, they're fixed in that document, and they don't change unless the document is amended. But positivism was not in any, uh, on the radar screen, really, in the 18th century. It started more prominently around 1800 with Jeremy Bentham, and then 1832 with John Austin, and the province of jurisprudence determined, and then with Augustus Comte in, in, in Europe in, in the mid-19th century. But there was virtually no one talking about a positivist theory of interpretation at the time of either the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution uh, uh, being framed and ratified in 1787 through then 1789. And the early Supreme Court opinions, all of them, of the early Marshall Court, all of them talk about a living constitution model of interpretation. They all talk about the constitution is intended to endure for ages and to be adapted to the various crises in human affairs. And all of the earlier cases look to later legislative executive practice and judicial reasoned elaboration of concepts uh, to interpret the constitution in a way different than the static interpretation uh, when the provisions actually were enacted. Uh, there is almost no support on the Marshall Court 1803 up to 1835 for a static interpretation model of interpretation. It was all living constitution. Even Madison, who was sort of a supporter of more limited government in some areas, in the famous case McCulloch v. Maryland, Madison supports a living constitution model of interpretation because that was the case about can you have a national bank, the famous McCulloch v. Maryland case. In 1791, when Congress voted on it, Madison took the position that the bank was unconstitutional, that there was nothing in the Constitution that gave Congress the right to have a national bank. That was Madison's position in 1791. But when Madison was president later in 1816, he signed a bill creating the second national bank, and Madison said in his signing letter, I think it now is constitutional, based on legislative, executive, and judicial practice since 1791, as well as the concurrence of the nation as a whole, sort of social practice. He said his view changed. The, he believed the, that the National Bank was not constitutional in 1791. He believes, though, it is constitutional in 1816, even though no language, no amendment has been passed, because he believed that later legislative executive action and judicial decisions can change the meaning of what is constitutional. Um, and that really is what the framers believed in. So this argument that when the court today has a living constitution model, they're doing something different than the framers anticipated, I think is just historically inaccurate. Now they're interpreting the constitution today different than if you ask the framers in 1789 how they would interpret it, or for equal protection and due process. If you ask the rat framers and ratifiers in 1868, what do you think it means? Yeah, they would give a different answer than what the court's giving today. But if you ask the framers in 1789, or for the 14th Amendment, 1868, if you ask them, how do you think the Constitution should be interpreted, say in 2015, you know, 100 plus years later, they would say, we think the judges ought to take into account later social developments, later legislative executive practice. I think they'd be very comfortable with how the Constitution is being interpreted today. I don't think they'd be shocked at all. They would say, well, yeah, you ought to interpret it from today's perspective and today's knowledge, not in light of what we thought a century or two centuries ago. Uh, now, that's just, a, that's to me the big debate, and certainly the Federal Society and the judges who support it disagree with that. And as a political matter, the Supreme Court's you know, closely balanced now. Uh, there's sort of four more liberal justices, four more conservative, and Kennedy's in the middle as a moderate, but he believes in a living constitution, clearly, in many of his. Uh, decisions. Um, but membership on the court can change. 
it's one of those interesting things that you know, had Hillary Clinton won the election in, in November, the way many of us in the media and everyone sort of anticipated, yeah. um, you know, Merrick Garland would have been on the court. You would have then had five strong votes for a living constitution. Justice Kennedy would have retired because he no longer would have been the critical fifth vote. He loves being the critical fifth vote. And so he asked, he sort of <laughs> telegraphed he was going to retire. Uh, early in last fall, he telegraphed he was going to retire at the end of the year. Uh, assuming, because he thought Hillary Clinton was going to win and Merrick Garland be on the court. And he'd no longer be the critical fifth vote. Well, then if he had retired, you'd get Hillary Clinton appointing another justice. You'd have six votes for a living constitution. And pretty much, and then you know, Ginsburg will retire and she'd appoint somebody. And there'd still be six with younger votes for a living constitution. Really, the debate would be over had that happened. Given what actually happened, you now still have an ongoing debate for the next generation because you have four democratically appointed living constitution, you've got four more conservative, more static constitution, you've got Kennedy in the middle, but he may retire at the end of this year, he may not. Uh, Justice Ginsburg may have health problems, she may not. Uh, the court's going to be pretty much equally balanced between a living and static constitutional model of interpretation, probably for the next generation. So what was looking like as of last September and October, a debate which was about to be resolved in favor of the living constitution and against the Federalist Society position of a static constitution, that's disappeared. That debate is still going to be going on now for the next 10 years, maybe the next 25 years, the next generation. Um, and so the debate continues on that. Um, okay, those are my points. Rebuttal and I have got to leave it a few minutes. Go ahead. And the rebuttal. Uh, I'm more interested in questions from students, okay. given that we have limited time. So I'll, I'll, I will graciously wave my rebuttal to Randy, <laughs> and uh, we'll go to the questions. Does the balance between living and static kind of help the building stronger push towards equity in the courts to Because you have both sides represented, you get a literal interpretation that gives you a little bit more of a constraint to new laws where the living constitution kind of allows you to get that ability of social change. Um, so I'll. I'll answer the question this way. Uh, if you look at Brown v. Board of Education, if you read this, it's, it's, it's fairly short, it's like eight or nine pages long. Um, Chief Justice Warren spends about a page or so saying, we really tried to look to the original meaning of the Constitution, right? We looked at the ratifiers of the 14th Amendment. How would they have understood segregated schools? And we found that it was inconclusive. That's where he is, inconclusive. The question is, why did he bother doing that? If we just start off by saying with the living constitution, let's just say, hey, it's unequal. It's unfair to have segregated schools. Let's be done with it. So judges, even the living constitutionalist bent, have this tangy instinct to look to history. Maybe they abandon it, but they at least try and say, well, the history is not conclusive. Let's move on from there. Look at a case like Heller, right, at the Second Amendment. Justice Stevens wrote a 70-page opinion that was originalist-ish criticize the methodology, but why would we just say, as a matter of our current society, there's no other country in the world that allows private ownership of guns like us? That's the question. So even if judges ultimately come out with a living approach, there's this innate yearning, a panging, to talk about history that uh, will remain no matter who's on the bench. And uh, uh, William Bode, who teaches at Chicago, has called this that originalism is the law, right? You start with originalism, maybe go backwards, right? You don't start with living constitutionalism. You start with originalism, and then maybe you deviate from it. So, even if you know Garland had replaced um, Scalia, and you know Kennedy was replaced by a Hillary appointee, I don't think originalism disappears. It may not provide the rule of decision, but it's still in our hearts. <laughs> it would have been the hearts of some, but not in the majority of the Supreme Court. <laughs> And as a matter of constitutional law, it would pretty much have very quickly disappeared. But that's not happening now. Now the debate continues for at least the next generation. And that's, maybe that's healthy that it continues for the next generation. But it certainly will. There's no question about that. Other questions? I want to ask one question from our officers before Mr. Kelso has to go. Um, it's one of the benefits of being an officer, you just ask questions. Um, what would you, if there was one thing you could amend, take away or add to the constitution, what would you think would be? If I were doing it, and, but it's never going to happen, so it's one of those academic questions, I would actually place limits on the Supreme Court justices' tenure. Term limits? Term limits. I would say give them a fixed term. Most constitutional courts around the world, the justice has had on those constitutional courts have fixed term limits. Now, in most cases, it's like 12 years. I think that'd be a little short given our tradition. 
but I would at least uh, place 24 years, take no more than 24 years on, on, on the court. So you'd have predictable retirements, not people strategically resigning or hanging on until you know, they die. Uh, uh, and you would have a more predictable turnover on the court. And you could then have presidents not always try to look like, I want to appoint somebody in their 40s, so they'll be there 35 years. Uh, you could have people who have a little more experience in their 50s uh, or, or early 60s to think, oh, they can now be appointed because you're only going to be on the 24 years anyway. And I think that would give you a better range of people being appointed. It would make it much less of an unpredictable happenstance game. And it'd be consistent with the way virtually every constitutional court around the world does it. But you're not going to get an amendment to, to limit the Supreme Court justice to 24 years. But that's what I would do. Oh, if I could make one change, what would it be? Uh, the 20th Amendment is, we really mean it. We mean what we said in the first 27. We mean it. Read it. Uh, but then, of course, they can throw that constitutional amendment as well. <laughs> we mean it. Shall not be the French. <laughs> Uh, 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 other questions? Um, Mr. Counselor, I don't want to keep you. Are That's you... okay. I just texted my hot five for a couple minutes. Great. Okay. I've got to go. My house flooded, and the general contractor's coming by at some point between one and two. But he's not there. Is that the cable man? Yeah, yeah he's not there yet. My wife's there, so I don't have to leave quite yet. So. Hold that for anybody? Okay. You with the red? Yeah, go for it. Somebody's got their hand up. I put the flat shirt. Were you raising your hand? Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's not you raising your hand. Thank you, yeah, see, okay. Um, well, I have lots of questions from our officers, so um, sure, I'll, I'll go there. Um, okay, so you're talking about the difference between a living constitution and a static interpretation. What about if, um, in, when you have an applied, an applied right? I'm thinking of Griswold v. Connecticut, the 1972 case from the Supreme Court that had a 7-2 decision, basically invalidated the law that prohibited use of contraceptives in a private marital situation. So um, we got this thing called the right to privacy that is not there. I mean, I kind of like the sound of it, but what do we do with that, these implied rights? Well, again, I, it's a matter from a living constitution perspective, you expect judges to take into account not only the text, context, and history of the provision when it was ratified, you expect the judges to take into account later legislative executive practice and later judicial precedents. And by the time you got to 1965 in Griswold v. Connecticut, the legislative executive practice among the states were virtually no states were banning access to contraception. Uh, Connecticut had a strange sort of outlier law uh, that actually wasn't even enforced. They said you can't buy contraceptives, but people were selling it under the, under the table in drugstores to people anyway, and the police were never enforcing it. Uh, and, and so yet, like over, uh, over three-fourths of the states had dropped their laws banning access to contraception. Even those 12 states which had it, like Connecticut, weren't enforcing it. So the legislative executive practice really was people have a liberty right to buy contraceptions if they want to. And the Supreme Court had developed some cases over the course of the previous 40 years of beginning to talk about aspects of, uh, of individual liberty and right to make personal decisions about one's own life that are fundamental to uh, ordering your life, like whether to have children or not, and uh, whether you want to have a reproductive sex or not. Um, and so, to me, Griswold isn't a case of an implied right. It's a case of looking at legislative executive practice, suggesting that the general society believes now, by 1965, you ought to have access, and the court having some precedents underscoring that notion of individual autonomy, individual liberty, and the court now saying to Connecticut, you got to get on board that almost all the other states are on board, we're not going to let you few states uh, sort of spoil uh, what's going on. Uh, and that's a living constitution. Uh, and to me, I, that's the difference. The static constitution would have said, as the two dissenters in Griswold said, well, it's not literally in the literal text of the constitution, so too bad. Uh, the living constitution said, no, we got to get Connecticut on board. Um, so I'm comfortable. I will say this. You know, in terms of the Constitution, it's very hard to amend. You only have 27 amendments, and 10 of them were right at the beginning. Our Constitution is very hard to amend. Uh, if you actually want to have a more static Constitution and make it practical, you've got to have the ability to amend it uh, a lot easier. For example, the Texas Constitution, it was drafted in 1876. It was drafted, I think, with more of a static constitutional, positivist model in mind. 
But it's pretty easy to amend the Texas Constitution. It's been amended 450 times uh, since 1876. They amend it all the time. Uh, to me, a static constitution theory of interpretation makes sense if you draft the document with easy amendments and then you constantly do what you need to do, which is amend it. So let me Our constitution isn't drafted that way, and so to try to impose that style of interpretation on it, to me, makes no sense. But so I, I agree with Randy. By the time Grizzle was decided, uh, virtually every state had repealed its laws concerning contraception bans. And even in Connecticut, it wasn't enforced. In fact, Estelle Griswold and the Bucks bound, Bucks, the, the, doc, the doctor, they basically begged to be arrested. Oh, yeah, they, they had to arrange it. It, it, was, it, was, it was set, set up for him to be arrested. So here's my question, it. right? During the pendency of that case, Connecticut repealed the law. Why couldn't they just lobby the legislature to repeal the law and be done with it? Because they wanted a judicial decision, right? If this is a law that no one enforces, why can't you just wait for it to be repealed? No one's being arrested by it. It was an utterly unnecessary decision because the law is about to repeal. Uh, uh, similarly, in Lawrence v. Texas, right? Between Bowers v. Hardwick, which I think was 87 or 88, and Lawrence v. Texas 2003, there were virtually, I can't think, was there, was there, was there a single sodomy prosecution in the United States? We, I can't think of any. Maybe there was, I don't know. Texas simply wasn't enforcing the law and because of an idiot cop in Houston, I don't need to make fun of cops, but this cop was an idiot who decided to arrest Lawrence and Garner. They had this case. And an idiot district attorney, I will call him an idiot. Chuck. Yeah, <laughs> you can call him an idiot. My understanding is the case was again set up like like uh, Griswold. No, they, no. They, I think they said no, 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 no. Oh, I'll give you the fact. Was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always want to determine it was a cop that they got to arrest. No, 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 no. no. So so the actually, idiot cop. Yeah, let me give you the backstory. <laughs> I didn't know that. Actually, so I thought it was a, there's, there's a book called <laughs> Flavoring <laughs> Conduct by uh, Dale Carpenter. It's not at SMU. So here's the story. Um, Interesting. Lawrence okay. was a white guy and Garner was a black guy. And they were in a relationship. There was another guy who lived in the same building that was jealous that Lawrence was with this other guy. <laughs> so the other guy called the cops on Lawrence and Garner and said that there's a, a black guy with a gun in the apartment. The cops show up, okay, and then there were four cops, and they disagreed about what they saw. Now, this is about to get dirty. Um, one cop saw anal sex, another cop saw oral sex. The other two cops had no sex at all. <laughs> I'm sorry. You cannot confuse oral and anal sex. It's not possible. These are very, these are very different acts of human biology. You can't confuse one or the other. Okay? You, you can't. See my mother-in-law's face. Uh, <laughs> so, Lawrence said we weren't even having sex. From, as best I can gather, they were probably naked on the couch cuddling. Whatever, right? They weren't even having sex. Okay? As soon as they were arrested, various civil rights groups decided we want to make this a test case. They actually pleaded no contest because they wanted to not have a, have, a, have a not guilty verdict. They pleaded no contest, right? The Houston DA, Chuck Russell, and Lumbo, the school, decided that he wanted to take this case up to the Supreme Court. Governor A.G. Abbott begged him, please don't appeal this case. I think it was either Ted Cruz or Coleman at the time. Do not appeal this case. Just, just let this one go, right? Don't, don't, don't prosecute this. And then he said, fine, I'm going to prosecute. Then, then, then Abbott said, let us argue it. Because, because Rosenthal had never argued a case in the court. If you want to see an example of horrible advocacy, listen to the arguments of Chuck Rosenthal in Marjorie, Texas. Chief Justice Rehnquist was so angry that he said, all right, sit down, do whatever. You're not making any good arguments here. So this was a mistake from top to bottom. They should have never charged them, should have never been arrested, and they should not have appealed to the Supreme Court. They should have just taken the Fifth Circuit decision and let it go. But because they did, now we have this decision, right? Um, the marriage cases are different, right? Those were laws being enforced in all of 37 or 35 states. That's a different story. But at least for Griswold and for Lawrence, these were statutes that no one was enforcing, and they should have just fallen into destitute. That's yeah, a although, although it does make, there are collateral consequences. For example, in Texas at that time, they weren't enforcing the sodomy statute. But suppose you say you wanted to be a police officer, and you actually were gay or lesbian. You had to be in the closet. You couldn't tell them that, That's true. or else they wouldn't hire you. That's because true. they'd say, oh, if you admit you're a practicing lesbian, you're violating the law, and we're not going to hire you as a police officer. So there were sort of collateral consequences to having that law on the books. Even though they weren't prosecuting people, you couldn't be But, but that wasn't the sodomy statute. That's the secondary statute you could have had a facial challenge to. But because they got rid of the sodomy statute and the whole circumstances surrounding it, it became possible for lesbians and gays to be in the police force and be out of the closet. There was a consequence of that happened because of that case. 
And, and the same thing in, in, in Connecticut, you could buy contraceptive, but you had to buy it under the counter and know the person is more squeamish, rather than just being able to you know, buy contraceptive the way you can buy it today. So there are collateral consequences to actually having the decision be made and getting rid of a law, even if it's not really being fully enforced. But that's it. I have always thought that the police officers were in on setting up the test no. case, and then they, they pushed it stupidly. But you, you think that? No, Dale Carpenter uh, wrote a book called Flagrant yeah. Conduct. Yeah. Well, I, I strongly recommend it. It's a very good book. <laughs> and, and actually, in, in Garner's New York Times obituary, they mentioned that, not Garner, not Lawrence's, uh, Lawrence died in the last couple of years. They mentioned this in the obituary of the Times. Okay. Although I'll say this, the advocacy of both of the Supreme Court would have made absolutely no difference to the outcome of that case. None. Kennedy was going to decide the case along with the liberals exactly the way he decided it, no matter what the piece of the case or argument were. I agree. Uh, yeah, well, once I it agree. got to the court, the outcome was... But if you want to look at what not to do in the court, listen to that argument. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it was not good. But it is one of those... It makes a good point, though. I make this point. Yeah, people go oral argument, Supreme Court, blah, blah, blah. I would say 90% of the time, the cases are going to be decided based on the briefs and how the judges are going to decide. I agree. An I oral agree. argument makes almost no difference in most cases, one way or the other. You can lose a case in argument, but you probably can't win it, right? So if you make a concession that you shouldn't, they can use that to nail you. So you can lose a case in argument, but it's very hard to win a case yeah, in argument. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Anything else you got before we finish up here? Any other questions? I don't know. I tested some hands. Put hand, hand over there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> Seems like I want to know: Is it new? This whole the executive district. Which, well, I guess it's not new. How fragile do you think our democracy really is when it comes to different branches disregarding the court? Because it seems to be not everyone is quite as we'll say peaceful about it as uh, before. Well. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, President Trump, with whatever excess he has, has basically followed court orders. I think he's tried to do so scrupulously. Um, in three cases, the Solicitor General has gone back to the Supreme Court saying, look, we're following the law, the Ninth Circuit screwed up. So I'm going to travel back here. And in three cases, the Supreme Court said, well, well, we'll split the difference. Ninth Circuit went too far, but Trump don't do this. Uh, there hasn't been an instance where the Trump has said, I'm not going to follow this too bad, right? I'm sure people think he said that, maybe his tweets suggest that, but at least as far as his lawyers go, they're trying to comply with court orders. Um, so I haven't seen that. Uh, now he's been disrespectful to the courts, he's criticized them in awful manners, in racist manners, but um, his lawyers have been trying to keep it, I think, a, 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 sh a ship that's rocking back and forth as sturdy as possible. So far, except for the part of Arpaio. And except for his tweets, I think, suggest to other people out there that they should feel more legitimate in you know, opposing uh, what a court says the law is. And that's, I mean, to me, that's the troubling thing of his tweets. He rarely legally follows up on them. But it creates a, you know, a social sense where he's encouraging other people to behave in ways that, fortunately, people in his administration aren't, aren't letting him behave in that. So it's, uh, I'm concerned about the tweets just from the message they send, but it's true in terms of officially his lawyers have stayed on track, except when he's got this, you know, I'm really worried about the pardon power and how particularly as the Russia investigation goes forward, uh, he's going to think, I've got the pardon power, I can use it, and there, there, are, there aren't any real limitations on, constitutional limitations on his ability to use the pardon power. Uh, in, the, the courts can't do much about that, really, the, the practical matter. And Congress isn't going to impeach him, I don't think, for it. So we'll see. We'll see. I think it's going to, I think one final point. I think it's really going to hurt Trump, though, when they go and hear the travel ban case. I think the fact that he sort of pardoned Arpaio and undermined the sense of the rule of law so outrages justices like Justice Kennedy, who so strongly believes in the rule of law, that I think Trump and maybe even Roberts, they're not going to give Trump any leeway when it comes to travel ban argumentation. Um, I think he's hurt himself on that uh, by showing that kind of disrespect. Now, we'll see. I may be wrong about that. But my sense is that he has hurt himself with the legitimacy with the court with that. Yeah. In what cases do you think it is appropriate for the president to pardon for offenses against the United States? 
Well, the, the question, and this I think is Randy's point, um, offenses against the United States, this argument refers to statutory violations of the law. Contempt is considered an inherent power of the court. So the argument that a number of law professors are advancing is that contempt can't be pardoned. And in fact, some law professors have actually asked the court to appoint a special prosecutor to go after, uh, continue prosecuting the case. Um, my, my opinion, I wrote a piece in the Ohio part, and I think it's actually very dangerous. I, I'm with Randy. If you start pardoning people to get around investigations, you're really screwing things up. Uh, I think that's a very, very dangerous trend. Uh, now, Ohio can still be pardoned, uh, prosecuted in state court, right? There's nothing a federal pardon can do to stop your state court prosecution. And civil damage is also an option, but that's only Ohio. If this is a Russia matter, um, there are no uh, analogous state law offenses the same way you would having a civil rights violation in, in, in Maricopa County. Um, so, in the particular case, I mean, our mayor is 85 years old. He's yeah. not even in the, 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 the officially in position anymore. He's retired. You know, I don't care whether he spent six months in jail or not. I guess I don't care. Uh, but to me, it sends a signal about some of these other things that may be yeah. coming up. I, I agree with Randy in this one. I, I was I was very troubled by the Empire part. Also, one other note on that. Usually pardons are issued after the appeals process winds its course. Yeah, yeah, I was saying, before you even sentence. He hadn't even sentenced sentence yet. Sentence him yet. He yeah. hadn't even sentenced yet. So it's a weird thing. We have a conviction, but no sentence. What, what does that even mean? Uh, so uh, that, that's problematic. Randy, we've got to go. I've got to go. All right, I'll take, I'll, take, I'll take a couple more questions, and we'll, uh, uh, we'll bounce around 1.30. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you guys have thanks so much. Randy, thank you so much. <laughs> Well, well, President, had, President Johnson was impeached, but he was removed. Okay. So, so there's a two-step process, right? How do you ever president, sure of a bullet, right? Or death, or anything else, or, 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 or um, what do you call it, if, he, if he's unable to proceed? Two, two steps. First, impeachment. A majority of the House representatives must vote on articles of impeachment, right? Well, you need 50, 51%, right? 50% plus one, right? After that, it goes to the Senate. You have to remove this president in the Senate, and you actually hold a trial. And in a unique circumstance, the Chief Justice of the United States presides at the president's impeachment. And you need two thirds to remove. So we've actually had two impeached presidents. President Johnson was impeached during Reconstruction. The impeachment vote, so the removal vote of the Senate fell by one, one vote short. President Clinton was also impeached in office from his uh, uh, perjury, uh, perjury with the Lewinsky affair. He didn't come close to two thirds in the Senate, wasn't even close. So you've got two impeached presidents. But your question, I think, is a good one, right? How do we know to remove the president? Um, in other countries, presidents are removed all the time. They're called coups, right? <laughs> Go look at Latin America, right? And there's a coup every five minutes, right? It, 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 you know, one coup after another. Um, the ability to remove a sitting president who was elected um, is not something to be taken lightly. And I think it's something to be done with a lot of discretion. Um, what are the standards that you can remove a president for? The Constitution says high crimes and misdemeanors. Right? What, what does that mean? Um, well, if you ask Randy, I don't know, but that, that phrase had a meaning in the English common law system. There was a, there was a meaning there. And, how do you fit the current offense into this old standard is largely going to be a question of how the voting members decide, right? It's a court, and each member of the center is like a judge. And they decide, I think he violated, I'm voting to remove, or I think he didn't, I vote not to remove. Um, these are hard questions, and when you go down the impeachment process, think of it this way, if you fail, you don't get enough votes, then what happens, right? You have this president who's been wounded severely, and that impairs his ability to lead. Um, now the foreign states, think of international law, right? How are foreign leaders going to look at a president that was almost thrown out of office? Now President Clinton's impeachment came towards the very end, I think in 98, you know, he was basically on his way out. But Trump was president, what, seven or eight months? Feels like a lifetime, right? But it's been about seven or eight months. Uh, I'm reserving judgment on the impeachment question. My point to all of you is, 
be very careful when you open up this route because it could backfire. Uh, a president who's unpopular and doesn't have a lot of power can't do much, right? A removed president, though, and the precedent that sets may be dangerous. Also, the VP probably much different. Uh, you know, as, as, as much as people don't like him, the VP is probably more or less the same policies. So you may get exactly the same thing after a two-year trial where government basically shuts down. I mean, the, the, the Clinton impeachment took up like a year, but it, it's a it's a, a consuming event. It just sucks you in. So again, I'm not I'm reserving judgment on it, but my point is approach it with the caution I think it warrants. That's another hand yeah, at the back. So We got our we're pocket constitution now, right? So the Ninth Amendment says, and I think this will be the last question people are trying to pack up. I'll finish this question all around. And then if you want to come up afterwards, you can ask me one on one. The Ninth Amendment says, the enumeration in the constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. So what does that mean? Um, at a minimum, what that means is the mere fact that we list the first eight amendments which give certain rights does not mean that those are the only rights that exist. There might be other rights now. That's easy enough. Question number one, does that mean the courts can protect those rights? Does that mean the courts can recognize those rights? Also, is the Ninth Amendment a provision that applies only to the states or the federal government? Griswold was a state law. The Ninth Amendment probably didn't apply to it at all. So it wasn't a good example. But the point to convey is there is this notion in our Constitution that our rights are not limited to those enumerated. And that, I think, everyone can figure out. Anything else? Well, um, as Professor Bachman said, you're welcome to come up and ask us some questions afterwards. I think we're going to call it a day. Thank you, Professor Bachman.